Namaste. Good afternoon here in Australia. And of course, uh, good morning in India. My name is Jim Verghese. I'm the National Chair of the Australia India Business Council. And I'm really uh, privileged today to have uh, the Honourable Peter Dutton, the Minister for Defence, to join us in this very important webinar today, uh, where we will explore the, the issues of the time at the moment, which will go in our Q&A and also you can think through it. And so I'd just like to, um, as I introduce, as, as we wait for the Minister to come, which you'll do in due course, I just want to say a few words about the uh, Australia India Business Council, but before I do so, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land we gathered with here in Australia. So I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we today, in every state and territory here in Australia, and pay my respects to the elders past and present. I extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples that are here today in our nation here in Australia. By way of context, the AIBC was established in 1986 and was founded to foster bilateral relations between the two countries. AIBC is the only premier non-profit organization with a mission to promote trade dialogue between India and Australia through nurturing and maintaining close relationships in both Australia and India with federal and state government agencies, the diplomatic core, the corporations, and the industry bodies. Now, it's rare that you actually have a body like this that is across every state. And on the screen, you'll be able to see very shortly the board of the ARBC, every president that is uh, elected in each state and territory is also a director of the Australia India Business Council Limited. And, and we also joined there by, uh, by our national advisors and of course our immediate past chair, uh, Shiva Nandikirala. Um, this gives you a sense of connectivity that we have, particularly in this current uh, COVID-19 crisis between Australia and India and how we can assist India. In addition to that, we have restructured the AIBC so we can increase trade and investment between our two countries. And on the screen, you will see uh, a major innovation, which of course is the creation of industry chairs in key sectors. And on the screen there, you will see that these sectors go from agribusiness to corporate investments chapter, education and skills, healthcare chapter, make in India chapter, financial services, information communications and technology, infrastructure chapter, sports chapter, resources chapter, SME chapter, startup and innovation chapter, and women in business chapter. Where there is a demand for new industry segments, and for example, like defense, we would seriously consider establishing an industry chapter in that area. The purpose of which is to increase the trade and investment between India and Australia. We're also establishing the Australia-India um, uh, business exchange, which we want to uh, get through and form ARBC business enterprises to, have to strengthen the presidents and the industry chairs. So without further ado, uh, while we're waiting for Minister Peter Dutton, I would like to open today's uh, proceedings. And let me start by asking our uh, patron for the Victorian chapter, um, what his perspective on this post-pandemic recovery plans are in, in relation to expectations from the federal government. Martin, over to you. Martin, Martin. Uh, I think Minister has already joined, Jim, and thank you. Oh, he has. Let, let's, let's hear from him rather than me saying anything. All right. With, with that, um, it's my very great privilege to introduce the Honourable Peter Dutton, the Minister for Defence. Now, on the screen... Um, you will see his profile very shortly. And um, Peter Dutton, of course, has a very good connectivity with the, with the Indian, Indian diaspora. And uh, here in Queensland, as a Queenslander particularly, you know, he's held in very high regard uh, by the Indian diaspora and generally with the multicultural community. So, Minister, we are very delighted that you're able to join us uh, for this um, webinar today, and we look forward to your keynote address. So, over to you, the Honourable Peter Dutton, Minister for Defence. 
over the years. Well, Jim, uh, thank you very much. It's a great pleasure. Uh, my apologies uh, for the delay in joining you. Uh, thank you very much for uh, the invitation to be with you tonight. Uh, thank you to all of those uh, within the uh, Business Council. Um, I want to say thank you for the work in which you uh, promote our bilateral relations. Uh, it is an incredibly important relationship and uh, I want to make sure that uh, we continue to grow the relationship, not to take it for granted. Uh, if we look at the realities uh, at the moment for India, it is confronting and I wanted to first touch on that. Um, Jim, your leadership here in Australia and this forum and many others has been quite remarkable. Uh, I also want to say though thank you first to uh, the national board members, uh, to the state and territory residents, uh, the council staff, uh, to uh, Revneet and my good friend uh, Vasan as well for hosting the event. Uh, but I do want to concentrate on the reality uh, that is confronting India, just in my opening remarks uh, to start with. It is a very dire situation. Uh, the National Security Committee of the Cabinet uh, met yesterday, and as we know, there were 320,000 COVID cases uh, yesterday recorded and more than 17 million cases. Uh, 200, over 200,000 people have died, and it is devastating news. Many of you will be involved in different efforts to provide support uh, to people within the Indian community. And uh, I really acknowledge that. Uh, from our own perspective, uh, we have been able to um, put together a package uh, decided on in the National Security Committee yesterday uh, that the Prime Minister's uh, outlined, and I'll come to that uh, in a moment. Um, I wanted to, uh, as well as touching on uh, this very important and, and timely topic, also talk about uh, the way in which the economy uh, we anticipate uh, will recover from COVID and also, very importantly, uh, the role that defence is playing in both the response to COVID but to the recovery as well. And the men and women of the Defence Force uh, really make us all very proud. And the work that they've done in hotel quarantining, uh, the work that they've done in response to the, national, the natural disasters uh, in our country over the course of the last 15 months or so has been quite remarkable, um, but many Australians will know them through their work uh, at Hotel Quarantine as well. And I really do pay tribute uh, to uh, all of our defence personnel, 17,000 of whom have been involved uh, in different activities uh, and credit to the Chief of the Defence Force who provides uh, that leadership. And uh, I want to make sure that we can continue uh, to provide support uh, in a timely way uh, to natural disasters in our own country, to pandemics uh, across the region, and if it's necessary for us uh, to use our assets uh, to, uh, to shift whatever equipment is necessary uh, to places like uh, India or those that have been affected by uh, natural disasters or the worst of the pandemic uh, as well. Uh, I've only been in this portfolio, of course, uh, for less than a month, so I have an enormous amount to learn, but I've been a part of the National Security Committee for the last six years, and I've watched and observed very closely the work of the Australian Defence Force, and I've worked with uh, the Chief of the Defence Force on Operation Sovereign Borders, uh, as well as the Chief of the Navy, Mike Noonan, uh, on OSB uh, over a number of years, and uh, we couldn't be better served by men of their mm -hmm. calibre. Uh, I do want to... Uh, recognise uh, that the Defence Force have also provided a lot of medical support, um, which is not necessarily well known in the Australian community, but uh, the support that uh, particularly the reservists, but uh, the full-timers as well can bring to uh, the administering of uh, vaccines within aged care facilities uh, is a very significant capacity that we have and that, uh, that will continue uh, to roll out. Uh, we as a, an economy, and, and all of you live and breathe this, uh, have done, uh, I think, exceptionally well. Uh, many businesses have done it tough and many continue to do it tough. Uh, but as we see um, our borders reopen, uh, which is not going to happen immediately, and uh, we need to be very frank about that, um, travel recommences. But in the interim, uh, we know that uh, we have the ability for um, domestic travel and uh, consumption of domestic goods that otherwise might have uh, uh, fled across our borders 
uh, as the underpinning, at least, of the economic recovery uh, so far to COVID. So uh, that's um, just a, a little bit by way of introduction. There is an enormous amount that we're doing with uh, India. Um, the work of the Quad leaders uh, the meeting in March um, was a great credit to, uh, to Prime Minister Morrison, um, but also to Mr Modi as well. And uh, it's an incredibly important uh, compact for our region. And many people will be watching the debate in relation to the uncertainty uh, within our region. But our friends in India, Japan, uh, in the United States uh, have never been more important to us. And we intend to consolidate that relationship uh, it's in India's best interests. It's in our country's best interests. Uh, it's in the region's best interests, uh, and we will continue to do that. Uh, mm -hmm. We have been able to provide support through uh, vaccines across our region as well, and we've been able to uh, look to countries for support. But we do know um, that at the moment, um, India is the country in our thoughts foremost, and we've been able to make a decision, as I um, mentioned earlier, and the Prime Minister's made uh, an announcement of at least most of this in part, that 500 non-invasive ventilators uh, with the scope to go up to 3,000. Uh, we're providing personal, uh, personal protective equipment, uh, 1 million surgical masks, 500,000 P2 N95 masks, 100,000 surgical gowns, 100,000 goggles, 100,000 pairs of gloves, 20,000 face shields, 100 oxygen concentrators, uh, with tanks and consumables. Uh, and we do hope that this goes some way to helping uh, our close friends and family. And uh, we will do more. And I certainly uh, reflect the Prime Minister's very deep uh, discussion on this topic uh, last night as to what more we could do. Uh, and further announcements will be made uh, to see what we can do. Um, just turning again to uh, what I think is a really important discussion for Australian small businesses and for many people within the um, Australian Indian community who are employers, uh, who have uh, their own houses on the line and small businesses and uh, talk a little uh, just on what we're doing um, in terms of uh, the economy and the way in which we went into this pandemic. We took a very early decision uh, to close our borders, as you know, with China and then the rest of the world and for an island nation of 25 million people, I think that served as well. Uh, the United Kingdom uh, might have a debate about whether they should have shut their borders uh, with Europe uh, sooner or not. And that's uh, uh, an ongoing debate and um, no doubt uh, will be tested there and in other parts of the world. But it meant that we were able to, uh, I think, get on the front foot. And uh, the fact that we've been able to uh, commit about $25 billion in direct support uh, is quite remarkable. Um, that is a response three times greater than we saw in the GFC, uh, and it's helped a lot of small businesses stave off what would have otherwise been certain bankruptcy uh, or uh, their businesses being placed into voluntary administration. Uh, it's a credit to uh, the Treasurer, to Josh Frydenberg, uh, but also to the states as well, um, despite a lot of the media commentary from time to time, there is a great deal of collaboration behind the scenes uh, between the three levels of government uh, in the response to uh, what has been a very significant disruption. Uh, by January, um, we will see about 1.3 million people have lost their jobs or were stood down to zero hours in April 2020. Uh, we'll see 94% of those people back at work. Uh, and that is quite a remarkable outcome. Uh, we want to make sure that uh, in the budget this year we provide support to uh, again to small businesses and the focus of the budget will very much be on uh, jobs and on service delivery and there is uh, a very significant stage of support uh, to continue on uh, support around aged care and uh, we've had a particular look at the way in which we can sh we can show support uh, to different uh, models of aged care uh, particularly those uh, that are delivering a service to a diaspora community and uh, the uh, different needs around language, et cetera, uh, in the delivery of that service. There's obviously a significant commitment in this budget uh, ongoing to the NDIS and uh, to a number of other areas. Uh, we have been able um, to do that because uh, we've, I think, made prudent decisions in the run-up uh, to this 
pandemic and nobody knows, of course, what's around the corner um, and we need to uh, put the budget in the best possible position and Australian businesses uh, to be able to grow and to uh, maintain those jobs. Uh, we are seeing, if I can turn to um, Defence for a moment, uh, uh, a different situation unfolding in our region than perhaps some uh, Australians have been used to or aware of. Uh, China has more influence uh, in the region. There's certainly uh, a reality around uh, the foreign interference in our own country. Uh, we've seen evidence uh, during the course of elections to uh, through uh, different newspaper, uh, particularly, but other mediums uh, delivering messages, uh, uh, very strong messages and influential messages. Uh, we've seen the theft of intellectual property. We've seen cyber attacks now uh, at a record level. And the investment that we've made over this decade of about $270 billion, uh, a significant part into our cyber defences, uh, I think is essential for confidence in this country and the way in which businesses uh, can invest and can do business online. And that will be a particular focus, uh, again, in this budget, but uh, into the years uh, ahead. We have a great capacity uh, to work with many neighbours, and we are, uh, as a country, philosophically, um, inherently uh, a good friend uh, to our near neighbours and to others in the region. But our sovereignty is important, and our values are incredibly important, and we need to make sure that we're willing to defend those and to stand up uh, to those that might seek to undermine them. Uh, so that, that has been the focus uh, within the defence portfolio uh, for a number of years behind the scenes, the ways in which we can uh, enhance our presence uh, and our influence in, in this region. Uh, we've made public announcements, as you know, in relation to the Pacific Step Up, where we do want to provide more support uh, into countries like Papua New Guinea and Fiji, the Solomon Islands, uh, et cetera. And we're able to do that at the same time that we can continue uh, important relationships like the Quad. And that uh, compact uh, really is just at the start of what it uh, has the potential to deliver. And um, I hope that, uh, that it can continue to, to compound in, in its effect and its benefit to, to both of our uh, countries. So, Jim, there, there are a number of things that, uh, that, that I'm very happy to expand on, but um, Perhaps in the interest of time, I'm best to leave it there and then uh, and then take questions or uh, take suggestions. And um, I'm just very grateful for the opportunity uh, uh, to be with you. I, I think our community in Australia uh, is a vibrant, uh, hardworking, energetic, uh, wonderfully patriotic community, and uh, it's a credit to many people on this line, on this call uh, that have provided leadership over a long period of time. Uh, into the Indian community and, and the way in which people are uh, able to, to transition seamlessly into uh, our country to work hard and to provide for their children uh, the family values that ooze from the Indian community, um, something that makes us all very proud. So thank you very much uh, for the opportunity and uh, I'll pause there and I'll hand back to you, Jim. Thank you very much, Minister Peter, for that <coughs> very, very uh, encouraging address you gave and, and the strong commitment by yourself and, and the Morrison government to the India relationship. We, we're very agile, so we play these um, webinars, we always finish on time. But before I do that, I'll ask our Victorian pa patron, that Vasan Srinivasan, who's, who's see me, will come on the screen very shortly. Vasan, is there some, some uh, words you'd like to say in relation to the minister and his commitment to India and the government? Over to you, Vasan. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. First of all, uh, Minister Dutton, thank you so much for accepting our invitation and joining us uh, this evening. I'm absolutely privileged uh, to have you on board in relation to promote our activities between AABC and the difference as well as India-Australia relationship, uh, Minister. And Minister Dutton was elected, you know, 20 years ago, 2001, very experienced person, been through a number of portfolios and I had the privilege to work with him in mission and multicultural affairs and border protection uh, during his role as a minister, as a member of Australian Multicultural Council, we managed to come up with that long-term parent reason. This wouldn't have happened without your support, uh, Minister Tutton. Uh, and 
also in relation to uh, you know, a number of round table conferences we held with uh, the education providers in Victoria and Brisbane and everywhere else along with the minister, which gave us quite a lot of uh, support in relation to bringing international students to Australia and supporting training organizations and universities. And again, you know, I, I'm really impressed that you know you are the only one uh, tested how difficult to come through with COVID. And excellent, we were praying for you during the time I was talking to your home minister on a regular basis and find out how you are keeping minister. And I appreciate and thank you for you and your home affairs minister, I mean Kirley Dutton, looking and supporting the mental health support services and activities in the state of Queensland. If anyone haven't watched Channel 9 Today show in between Minister Dutton and Richard Miles, I, I would encourage you to watch it, see how humorous Minister Dutton could be. And I know as a friend, you're always available for the benefit of my Indian community in Australia. You never let me down so far, Minister Dutton. And you always protect Australia and Australians for our safety and health. Thank you so much. I'm looking forward to working with you in relation to ABC activities. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Varshan. And before we get into the question time, I'd also like to introduce uh, Ravneet Pawar, our, our Victorian ABC president. And on the screen there, you see her very impressive uh, CV. She's actually in a very unusual situation as one of our uh, presidents in one of our key states. She's both in India and Melbourne, currently in, in India. And as you can see, they're very impressive uh, CV. And Ravneet, you may just want to share with us, uh, we're almost sort of, before we go into question time, any comments you'd like to make uh, in relation to this webinar and the, and the expectations from it. Thanks, Jim. And um, thank you, Minister Dutton. It's uh, such a pleasure to hear you talk about your commitment to India, and especially in these uh, very unprecedented times. Um, I am in India right now, and I am in Delhi, in the heart of COVID-19 surge uh, that India has been hit. And I can tell you that any word of support and encouragement uh, will go a long way in further building the very strong relationship between Australia and India. Um, and I think that what you have talked about today and what we have been reading in the newspaper that the current uh, government uh, is very, very keen to support the initiatives of trade, um, of support of people to people linkages and for health um, safety uh, of citizens in Australia and supporting India as we go into this very, very difficult phase of what India is going through. So thank you, Minister, so much. It does mean a lot to all of us um, and, and our families here. I also want to say that defense plays a very important role between two uh, nations. And I do understand, and I have been attending a lot of the bilateral um, uh, collaborative roundtables, which does talk about the Quad and talks about how important defense is going to be as we go into the future with this partnership. So um, thank you so much for your support. And I'm really looking forward to hearing more initiatives about how we can work closely between our two countries. Thank you very much, Ravneet. And uh, Minister, I'll just ask some of the questions that have uh, come to me on the, uh, on the uh, webinar. And the first question is, what is the government's policy on academic accredited education online for learning online from overseas, such as students being and enrolled from India? Well, Jim, obviously uh, there's been a massive disruption and there's been a lot of effort uh, underway to understand how we can reopen uh, the pipeline for international students and uh, travel more generally, which has uh, obviously taken up a lot of our time. Uh, the universities have had a different approach, uh, university by university. Um, you would know better than me about their capacity to, uh, to deliver online and uh, for many of them, uh, there's been a revolution uh, and the ability to uh, allow that engagement to continue, um, to continue the usual processes uh, of uh, their delivery and uh, an engagement with, uh, with those students. And um, the, 
usual processes uh, around that will uh, will apply, and um, I suppose it depends on uh, the individual circumstances. But um, there is as much as we can do from a federal Department of Education, um, a continuity of uh, the way in which the business is able to operate uh, um, that, that are universities and uh, the way in which they can uh, they can deal with both their teaching staff as well as their their students. Thank you for that. And I have a question then from Peter Prem from Hall Chadwick. And you you partially answered this question in your address, but what can we in Australia do to assist our friends in India in this difficult time? Well, Peter, I, I think uh, financial support uh, obviously is uh, is important uh, to different organisations that might be uh, gathering um, support. It's difficult for us to uh, to dispatch. Uh, you know, gatherings of, uh, you know, produce or uh, medicines or supplies that people have brought together, which might be the natural instinct in, uh, in, in a natural disaster or uh, an event in our own country. But uh, India has put out uh, very clear requests for uh, what they need to meet this challenge. And Australia is guided by that advice and uh, obviously, Barry O'Farrell, who I think is doing a great job uh, in uh, his role at the moment, we're able to uh, to identify what the needs might be. But but oxygen is the greatest need. <coughs> Excuse me at the moment. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and so uh, those those medical supplies, PPE, uh, any of that equipment is uh, is incredibly important. But but there are many from the business community that are putting together uh, collaborations with companies in uh, India and uh, other ways in which they might be able to, to deliver supplies and goods to families. Um, but it is uh, in terms of air travel and uh, dispatching things from our country, uh, it is difficult at the moment. Uh, Ravneet, you're, you're sitting there from a dual perspective of both Australia and India. Do you, do you have a question to ask to the Minister? Well, uh, I mean, I totally agree with you that at the moment, the most uh, difficult situation is, uh, you know, the health system here in our country. And uh, because, uh, you know, like anywhere else in the world, the health system is only there to take 15, 20% of, you know, the population. And in India being such a vast population, I think, uh, uh, because the surge has been so, um, I would say, rapid and so sudden that it has just you know, paralyze the entire country. Um, so any support from, um, you know, Australia in terms of equipment or oxygen uh, cylinders, concentrators, kits, and is, is going to be really, really well appreciated. Um, also, um, you know, I've also heard that there are doctors who are ready to give support online, um, you know, to people yeah. here, which again is really good because the health system here is so overburdened that uh, you can't get support into uh, any hospital at the moment. People are setting up um, ICU units in their homes. Um, you know, so you need a doctor on call all the time. And I personally know, um, you know this that has happened to people uh, and, and, and it is devastating. So we do live in very difficult times and I want to thank the Australian government um, personally and professionally for all the support that it is being extended uh, to India and people that are currently in this difficult situation. So, Minister, my question to you is going to be a little bit away from this. It's going to be on, on defense and it is going to be on um, role of education institutions uh, between the two countries in supporting um, uh, the collaboration between India and Australia in defense. Because, I mean, I work at Deakin University and I know that, for example, at Deakin, we do a lot of amazing research in defense with Australia and in some other parts of the world. But we do not have that collaboration for education and research and defense with India. With the Quad and with all the, uh, all the um, I would say, focus on enhancing the ties with India, do you see this happening in the future? And do you see that this will play a very important role in guiding our focus across the two countries? Well, I, I think it's an excellent suggestion and there's an enormous amount of collaboration, as you would expect, with uh, research institutes. Uh, the science and technology aspect of defence uh, is quite a remarkable undertaking and that is done in collaboration with uh, a number of institutions and some of that work obviously 
uh, is publicly uh, acknowledged, uh, other elements of it not. Uh, but I think there's an enormous opportunity uh, to, to form those collaborations through the Quad uh, with institutions in India and, and identifying uh, the requisite skills or the capacity within uh, you know, different schools and uh, ways in which we can uh, bring that expertise into, into the relationship, I think would be uh, a great benefit and a great uh, uh, derivative of uh, the, the collaboration through the quad. So I'd, I'd, I'd be very happy to, to work with you on that to identify, you know, the institutes and, and the schools within the, the universities that, uh, uh, that, that might house that talent and, uh, and have that two-way exchange. I, I think that is, uh, that is a very good suggestion. Thanks, Minister. And uh, just one more question, Minister. I just wanted to check with, with the focus on defence. Where do you actually see the relationship going? What are the top two or three things in your mind that you will want to build with India in the partnership with defence, given the Quad at the background? Well, I think uh, the, the, the first thing is to uh, bring like-minded countries together. That's the, uh, the most important aspect. And uh, to have as many coalition partners, if you like, as, as possible. And there's, there's a natural affinity between uh, Japan, India, the United States, Australia. Uh, it's uh, strategic, strategically essential for us to, to do so. Uh, so that, that I think uh, is you know, important if we can uh, find others within the region, uh, uh, you know, Vietnam, Korea, uh, Indonesia, all very important partners uh, at different levels, and uh, the the collaboration um, across as many countries as possible, I think, sends a very powerful uh, and direct message. So that that's uh, I think the the leverage that comes out of the quad and the ability to uh, to really compound um, the success that we've had already. The second point is uh, obviously in relation to training, to capacity, uh, to exchanges and so that there is an interoperability, uh, the ability to, to share uh, the sorts of uh, you know, intellectual property that you were talking about before, uh, intelligence and uh, ways in which we can uh, share that intelligence is, is you know, a foundation element of, of the relationship and there will be different levels uh, of, of capacity and of uh, integrity within systems and uh, so there, there, there will be an effort to uh, to build that and to work more closely together in uh, in the exchange of intelligence. Thank you, Minister. Over to you, Jim. Thank, thanks very much, uh, Ravneeth. Uh, one of the thing, one of the initiatives the IBC is taking is working with the with our counterparts in India, the Federation of Indian Chambers of Commerce and Industry, the Confederation of Indian Industry, and the India Australian Chamber of Commerce. What we'd like to do from business to business relationships is during this very challenging time, keep those business relationships going and, and trade and investment. And you mentioned the Honorable Barry O'Farrell before, and he's certainly very supportive in that direction. What is your perspective on that? And, and, and do you think that is something the Australian government uh, would see as a good initiative that we, that we join with our, our, our counterpart agencies in India and work together? Yes, Jim. I, I mean, without hesitation, and I think, uh, as you say, this is something that uh, that Barry's very interested in. So, uh, I suppose it's just a question of identifying the immediate gains and uh, ways in which, uh, you know, individually or collectively, as as ministers, as a government, uh, we're able to uh, to lend support to that. But uh, I, I think Barry's an excellent con excellent conduit to, to uh, you know to form those relationships and, and bring those opportunities together. And a related question is we are getting lots of different levels of support. For example, today we had the Lord Mayor of Brisbane offering to support ARBC in what it's doing. Do you think there is uh, perhaps a, an opportunity here to have one point of donations, like you just mentioned with the Australian government, um, where we can channel it more effectively like we did in the bushfires, for example, here in Australia? Uh, yes. Uh, the question is just how, how you give effect to that. Um, to that decision because there'll be, uh, you know, different organisations uh, whose business it is to uh, bring all of that, uh, you know, that charitable effort together. 
uh, and they won't easily give up that um, that space. So it, it's just a question of how you can collaborate, uh, perhaps with um, you know a multinational or, or uh, a, an organisation that has the infrastructure, um, perhaps to to bring it together. And uh, it, it it is just you know some and we've seen this during the floods and whatnot. Uh, Mm. But, but hurt, hurting cats sometimes because I mean there are many people who are uh, incredibly well intentioned and have different capacities in, the, in their own communities and uh, and understandably want a tight control on the ways in which the money is raised and the way in which it's dispersed. Uh, so it's just a matter of bringing all of that goodwill together, um, and I, I wouldn't underestimate how difficult that is. Yes, and and what uh, we have uh, been very encouraged by the Indian High Commission. And, okay. and the Indian offices throughout our nation, in, from Perth to Melbourne to, to Brisbane to Sydney, they've been very, very uh, good in saying these are the sort of uh, resources that you can put in. Uh, and, the, of course, the Indian Medical Association. How do we, uh, together with Barry O'Farrell on the Australian end, uh, do you think it's worthwhile having a, a forum with the support of the Australian government to just to help herd those cats together, as you put it? Yes, yeah, I think I, I think so, and I think DFAT would be, uh, you know, very obliging, uh, and, and perhaps, as you say, through uh, the High Commissioner uh, would be the natural starting point uh, to build on the efforts already underway. Um, but certainly, uh, we can help make the connections with DFAT, or, uh, uh, or no doubt you're better connected uh, through DFAT than I am. I suspect. Well, I think it's uh, you know we I think we what we are what the Indian diaspora and business to business end is impressed by is the commitment, uh, Minister, that, that you made in your speech and of the Morrison government. Is there, from your point of view and looking where we are now in this very difficult time, what would you like to see more of and less of from the Australian India Business Council and our network and the Indian community associations? Well, I think what I'd like to see a continuation of is uh, the engagement and, and the building of uh, these relationships because, uh, as we all know, in our own businesses, uh, in our own uh, walks of life, it's uh, the ability to pick up the phone in a time of need or uh, a time of opportunity and uh, and to, to lean on the relationship already established. It's very hard to... Uh, like in any situation, any any you know business discussion, uh, to sort of cold call and uh, and have the the understanding, the trust, the relationship that uh, otherwise would have built up over a period of time. So, uh, I, I think when you look at the uh, the, the quality of people uh, involved in the council, the way in which you all have your individual networks, but bring that together. Uh, frankly, I think that is uh, a very impressive model and any ways in which that can be enhanced, I think, is uh, is where the opportunity um, exists. I just got a, um, a message from uh, WhatsApp from the audience um, saying, do you think, and, and it's actually endorsed by uh, Tanyoni, our National Chair or Industry Chair on Health. She's saying, do you think that the Red Cross might be the best avenue for to direct donations into into India, particularly the oxygen or oxygen related areas. Uh, Tanya, I, I think they would be a natural partner. Um, no, no doubt there'd be others, but uh, the IRC would be a natural partner and uh, and you know a partner of choice for us uh, at at different times where we've been able to uh, to work with them to uh, you know deliver services on the ground, but to uh, to support their. Um, their philanthropic um, work and, and effort as well. So yes, I, I think they'd be a natural partner. And the other the other question that um, that I had is uh, the perception of India in this kind of crisis can can sometimes be negatively portrayed in in, in some areas. Um, what's the best way to preserve this very very important growing relationship with the Quad? And, and in fact, as you've said in your keynote address, how do we enhance this relationship during these challenging times? Your best friends are doing your challenging times. Yes. Uh, well, Jim, I'd, I'd planned uh, for India to be my first uh, country visit. And 
In fact, we had uh, planned to be there about now uh, and that was called off and uh, turned into to a virtual meeting with uh, with my counterparts. And uh, so from my perspective, I mean, that, that hopefully gives a sense of the importance of the relationship and uh, all, all of us go through highs and lows and, and difficult uh, periods and, and different capacities to respond, et cetera. Uh, I, I think the perception for most Australians now is formed through uh, the friendship and the respect that they have across, um, you know, the back fence or uh, at their local store or at the local church or a local sporting club, whatever it might be. And uh, I, I think there's just a deepening respect for the Indian culture and for uh, uh, for the community here in Australia. And I mean, people will be hurting uh, across the country at the moment, um, you know, none more than those that have family or friends directly impacted, but uh, it, it, you know, genuinely hurts all of us to see uh, the situation unfold as, as it is at the moment, but uh, India will work through that and, uh, and they'll build capacity and, uh, and, and as you point out, good friends uh, like Australia will, will help them through that period. Just turning the, the focus to defence, one of the areas of interest from, from our members have been the defence industry supply chain and the potential role of Indian companies, particularly some of the large companies in, 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 in assisting with sovereign capability, a whole lot of uh, diversification of risk, um, what message should we be giving to the large Indian corporations that are very, very adept at defence and defence innovation? Well, as, as I pointed out before, it's a near $300 billion investment over this decade and uh, the export capacity now of some Australian companies uh, is uh, developing or has developed and is quite a remarkable opportunity for us. Uh, we've had a particular focus on Australian industry uh, capacity and capability, and uh, there are companies that have decided uh, to uh, to onshore and to uh, to enhance their domestic workforce. Uh, so we've been quite deliberate about the way in which we have uh, been asking primes and uh, and others in the supply chain uh, to uh, you know not not just have a shop front here, but to have the ability uh, to employ and and to develop their technologies, etc. And uh, and so I think that's the opportunity that, uh, that exists. There might be a pre-existing relationship and uh, there might be greater opportunity that comes from a, a heavier presence in, uh, in Australia. So given those comments, do you think this is an appropriate time for us to encourage Australian universities with their, with their Indian counterparts to look at the area of defence, defence industry, defence research and look at possible exchanges? Yeah, yes, I do. I, I think... The, uh, the investment, the ramp up, uh, the, the, the cyber uh, investment that we're making, um, all of that has uh, an opportunity for natural partners uh, to benefit. So uh, yes, I, I think there's an enormous opportunity and it'll be a key part of uh, the Australian economy. And as I say, as we develop uh, further export markets, uh, the, the, the local industry continues to grow and uh, the multiplier effect for our uh, domestic economy here is, is quite remarkable. And in that context of cyber, uh, a little known fact is that Tata is, is the largest IT service provider in the world. Now, do you see an opportunity for Indian ICT industry, the large ICT from Infosys to Mahindra Tech to uh, Tata and to uh, Wipro and all those similar companies to start making their cyber presence much bigger in Australia? Should we be encouraging them? Uh, what's your views on that? I, I, I think we should be encouraging them. Uh, I think the focus for defence and the Australian Signals Directorate and the Australian Cyber Security Centre will be on that higher end capacity and uh, the ability to disrupt uh, state actors, but also uh, organised groups that, uh, uh, that we're all very familiar with. So I, I, I don't think this is an area where there's a shortage of work. And I, and I think the most important point is that uh, there is a, a massive uh, underinvestment at the moment in that cyber workforce. And uh, I think there's enormous opportunity for uh, that skill um, to be, um, you know, to be imported, uh, to be locally developed. And uh, we're going to need 
you know, all hands at the wheel in, in the years to come in the, in the fight on cyber. I mean, that is the, that is the, you know, the new frontier. One of the, and this is a more, a, a more trickier question, one of the issues that have come to me from, from some of these large firms is they need visas for their highly talented people to come to Australia, you know, and actually build that intellectual capital and do what you're saying. Um, how do we facilitate that by, um, so that that can happen? Well, I, I think the first objective for the Australian government is just to make sure that we've got integrity in the process. So uh, where people are able to establish their bona fides, where uh, they're able to provide verification of uh, claims of, of study or um, ability, et cetera. Uh, and, and particularly if that's going through uh, a particular firm, uh, that they're able to establish um, their bona fides with the department. I think that's an important element to it. Um, but th th there will be, in my judgment, uh, uh, an enhancement in the, in the numbers that we need, uh, given the, the lack of uh, migration that's taking place at the moment and likely over the next 12 months, uh, as we want to grow and, uh, and, and make sure that we can benefit from what I think will be a good story for Australia to tell over the next few years. Um, that's, you know, I think that's part of the, uh, you know, part of the picture of trying to get uh, more people here in a, in a more conducive environment. But, uh, but those that, um, you know, that we can establish as, as being the best and, uh, and, and the best available in their field. Thanks very much, uh, Minister Peter, for all those uh, uh, answers to those questions. I really appreciate it. I'll ask now uh, Ravneeth to deliver a vote of thanks right. to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jim. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Minister. It's been such a pleasure listening to you and uh, what an insightful session. Um, and the supportive plans and the insights shared by you will go a long way in establishing a much more robust partnership between our two countries. Um, thank you so much. Um, and also uh, the initiatives around uh, the collaboration for defense, um, you know, uh, has been extremely useful. Um, you know, we are looking at a lot of collaborations in training, um, as well as in research across the sector between our two countries. And I think that um, given the uh, post pandemic recovery plans, uh, we will be um, fostering those partnerships um, sooner than later. I'd like to thank you, Minister, um, for your talk and for your support and for your collaborative approach uh, to where we see this wonderful partnership between our two countries going. Um, and I, I have no doubt that uh, India will come out of this stronger than before, and uh, we will take this relationship with Australia to the very next level. Um, thank you so much uh, for being with us. Thank you uh, to our national chair, Jim Verghese, for moderating this webinar beautifully, and uh, also for making sure that the minister was able to answer the questions of the people uh, you know, in attendance. Um, Thank you to my patron, um, Mr. Srinivasan. Thank you so much uh, uh, for always being there to support um, the AIBC Victoria chapter as well as the AIBC more in general, and for all the wonderful support you give to the Australia-India relationship. Uh, to the entire AIBC team uh, and AIBC Victoria management team for their support to put this together, and also to Wendy uh, at the National Secretariat, Karishma at the Victorian Secretariat, Vishal, uh, for all your technical and digital support. Thank you so much, everyone. It's been a pleasure to um, be a part of this wonderful session um, and um, stay safe. And thank you very much for your support. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank thank you, you very you. much, Ravneeth. And thank Minister you. Peter, as we, I normally finish these um, webinars by asking each of the participants just to give me three important words from your point of view that expresses the key message you'd like to give. What would your three words be? Sorry, Jim, that's a question to me? Yeah, question to you. What are your three words? I'll be asking Ramit the same question. Uh, well, I, uh, that, that's a good question. I think my, my, three, my three words would be, uh, firstly, I think, uh, I think friendship. I think that's the first word that, mm -hmm. uh, that uh, comes to my mind. Uh, I think uh, depth of, uh, uh, well, if you're after three words, I'd, I'd say friendship, uh, depth and, and trust. And I really think that underscores, uh, 
you know, it, uh, from from my perspective, from a de defence perspective, uh, what is most important, uh, the the trust that we have um, uh, is quite remarkable. Uh, friends that we can rely on, and and a deepening of that, and that that really is the priority that uh, uh, that I see um, for us. So um, thank you so much, and thank you uh, for the kind words uh, before as well. Thank you. Thank you for that. And Ravni, what are your three words? Well, I think listening to the minister, my three words that come to my <laughs> mind is um, empathetic, um, supportive and collaborative. Yes, and I think uh, are you, uh, you know, uh, Basin, you got three words? Uh, Jim uh, and Minister Duffin, as uh, John Howard said when I was in India in 2006, the, the best thing between India and Australia, curry, cricket, and community. <laughs> Thanks, Vasan. You, I thought you were going to say curry, cricket, and the Commonwealth. Yeah. <laughs> but let me let, let, let me join with the minister and say I think friendship, I would agree, is very important. And I also think the depth of the relationship is very important and the future focus of the relationship to strengthen the bilateral relationship, particularly in trade and investment. And so that on, on that note, Minister, we always pride ourselves on finishing on time. I thank you all again and for our audience in India and Australia. Namaste and look forward to our next webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well done, Jim. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.